All right. Here we go. My son gave me dap, y'all. <laughs> Does it smell good? <laughs> Never. Teenage boy smells. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I can't see all of you, but I know we've got a good turnout today. Um, for those of you who are visiting us from other institutions or as guests of ours today at the University of Colorado, welcome to the Academy of Medical Educators Grand Rounds. I am Shanta Zimmer, the Senior Associate Dean for Education and Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. I'm very excited, like very excited um, to introduce our speaker today. My dear friend, Dr. Kimberly Manning, is a general internist and hospitalist and also the Associate Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Department of Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Manning is a full professor in the Department of Medicine and is also a residency program director for the Transitional Year Residency Program at Emory. Wanted to make sure that this audience in particular knew that Kimberly had many roles um, crossing the spectrum of medical education. So within the GME space, she's a clear leader. She also though um, holds a position in the Semmelweis Society. And those of you here at Colorado know that we're um, planning to expand our advisory college program with our new curriculum. Um, and so Kimberly has experience as being a participant in that program since 2007. Um, there are four academic houses within the medical school. Um, at Emory. And I was uh, fortunate to have known her during that process and also share one of those roles with her um, back in the early days of that curriculum reform process. And it's been a true pleasure to be able to work with her and to stay in touch and to be friends during this time. Dr. Manning is recognized um, nationally for her teaching um, and for her writing. Uh, some of the prestigious awards that she's won include uh, the ACGME Parker Palmer Courage to Teach Award. Um, and also at Emory, uh, the Evangeline Papa George Award. Um, that award is in particular importance to me as an alumnus of the University of Emory University School of Medicine because it's one that's selected by a committee um, and given to one teacher in the school at graduation. Um, of course, she's also won numerous awards within the residency training program um, and also at Grady Hospital where she practices. Um, nationally, you would have read her work in journals such as uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, and the JAMA. Um, some of you also, I know, follow Dr. Manning on Twitter, where she shares um, incredibly moving narrative stories. Um, and this summer, uh, she was uh, particularly honored to have been asked to write a paper, um, which she's going to share with us um, today um, in the talk that we've invited her to give. In addition to all of those identities um, that Dr. Manning brings to the table, she's also a mom, a wife, um, we share the teenage boy uh, role of teaching at home, and she's an alumnus of both Tuskegee University and the Meharry Medical College. Um, Kimberly, I wanna leave some space for you to actually give your talk. Um, thank you so much for being here, friend. Um, we really appreciate you um, joining us virtually from Atlanta, and the only thing that would make it better is that if we could give you a hug in person. Um, so thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm particularly thankful that I did get an opportunity to come and see you all back in December. And so um, I definitely feel like I'm, I'm returning home to see some friends. Um, I have nothing to disclose financially, uh, but what I was telling Dean Zimmer um, earlier was that one of the thing I, things I do disclose is that um, 
th this is a, an emotional topic and um, it is possible that while giving this emotional topic, it, it could move me to tears. It might not, um, but it might. And um, if that's the case, um, I will feel your virtual hugs <laughs> from, from Colorado. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I always like to start with gratitude. And um, I learned that from um, my friend, Dr. Zimmer. And um, this is an image that makes me really happy, but also that motivates me um, to, to think about, to talk about, to push forward um, for more inclusive spaces and um, this work of anti-racism. Um, this is a group of uh, students from your amazing medical school. And um, these laughs are absolutely real. We were really having a great time here. Um, but I also um, got an opportunity to be present uh, for your White Coats for Black Lives rally. And um, an exciting thing about your institution is that you this is nothing new. You guys didn't just do this in response to the acute things of 2020. This is work that uh, CU has been doing for a long time. So as Dean Zimmer says, at CU, they see you, that's for sure. And I, and I, and I see you guys too. I also want to just um, share this quote, um, which I'd like for all of us to be reflecting upon as we listen to this entire thing. And because really, ultimately, hearing the stories of others is an opportunity to, as my Beyonce, Brian Stevenson says, um, get proximate. We have to get proximate. And this image here is probably one of the most powerful things that I think I've seen in my career. This is when I was at Colorado um, back in December. It was a cold day. And um, I saw my friend who happens to be one of your deans lying on concrete. And if this is not getting proximate, watching faculty and students and people who identify as black and people who identify not as black, just who care about human beings, lying on the ground together. Um, if that is not proximate, I don't know what is. So that is also a piece of my gratitude. So thank you. So um, let's start with um, a definition. <clears throat> you know, we hear this word pandemic um, and we hear it kicked around this idea of two pandemics, but let's just make sure we have a working definition, which um, Merriam Webster says is occurring over a wide geographic area and affecting an exceptionally high proportion of the population. Um, so that being said, um, we are all very familiar with the acute pandemic of COVID-19 and how it has not only spread across the world, but definitely how the United States is in definitely a hot spot, but also um, the pandemic of racism, which is a chronic pandemic, but its chronicity does not make it any less widespread or affecting a large part of the population. And I'll return to this image to tell you more about it later. So as we know, um, it's, it, at this time last year, we weren't even thinking about SARS-CoV-2. We didn't even really know what it was. And um, now we can see that it's spread across the world. But also in the United States, um, there pretty much is not even a spot in the United States that has not been impacted by this pandemic. And it meets the, the, the definition of a true pandemic. We've also heard this word over and over and over again. These are unprecedented times. With the, with the um, introduction of COVID came this term, unprecedented, which if you refer to uh, a dictionary again, says never having happened or existed in the past. So certainly for the, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the effects of it for us, in this lifetime for us, it is unprecedented. Right. And so um, we're seeing um, so much disrupted. We, we can't even see each other's faces outside of Zoom. I had a, a M4 on my team that I worked with for a whole month last month, and I really don't exactly know what her face looks like. <laughs> um, there are people who are getting married who are wearing masks at weddings, and there's just so much re being reworked for how we operate. Um, our mentor mentee meetings. Um, to the advantage um, of, of technology, we're able to um, reach across the country and talk to each other, but not in person. Um, classrooms and opportunities have shifted. Um, this is a, these images are from a visiting professorship that I did at Duke, and um, it was originally scheduled to be in person, but then shifted to an online platform to accommodate it. So glad I got to see y'all back in December. 
even us teaching um, physical examination and practicing physical examination. This is on the left me with my small group students and we are um, doing some physical exam maneuvers with um, one of our standardized patients who agreed to allow this picture to be shared. Um, definitely a lumpy experience, something that is unprecedented for us, um, but I'm certain that you all are facing similar um, hiccups as well. And then here on the right, our student clerkship for underrepresented minorities who visit the Department of Medicine at Emory had to be shifted to a virtual visiting mini clerkship. And again, something that we would have never thought to do. And people like me are wearing scrubs. <laughs> Folks that you never saw wear scrubs in your life now are wearing scrubs to care for patients because of these unprecedented times. Match day. Oh my goodness, as Dr. Zimmer mentioned, I've been a small group advisor since 2007 and I call match day Med Ed Christmas. It's one of my favorite days of the year. And for the first time in this unprecedented time, our students, our advisees didn't get to have that celebration with us in person. So here's a FaceTime with one of my small group advisees who got her first choice. And then um, milestones, um, as we know, have been shifted. This is my niece, Gabrielle, who graduated at the top of her class in high school, and my nephew, David, who graduated from Emory University this year, um, both of whom had to have virtual commencements um, where none of us could be together or present to see them in person. And here's me with my mother. Um, this is how I've had to visit my mother, especially when caring for patients affected by COVID or persons under investigation on the wards. These are unprecedented times. Education has shifted outside of thinking about patient care. There's also figuring out what our kids will do next. These are my sons here in their virtual learning environments. Their, their public schools do not have an in-person option right now. And again, this has been a great shift for all of us. And so for the most part, what I've shared with you so far is really similar for me as it is for all of you. Many of you have had the same concerns that I'm describing right now. Um, but um, the other thing that we started to see was um, how COVID-19 really amplified health disparities that we already knew existed. Um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that African Americans make up approximately 12% of the U.S. population. Um, yet for COVID-19 cases um, nationally, they make um, up the a, a majority proportional um, to to the num to the percentage that they are in the community. And in certain cities, especially cities that have larger numbers of African Americans, because this is the U.S. average. If you look at um, the cities like Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, these numbers um, look much different. And so um, in Georgia, for example, um, though um, Black Americans make up about 30.5% of the population in Georgia, um, for hospitalizations, over 80% of those in the hospital with COVID-19 are Black Americans. And again, these are things that um, as a as a black American that and a physician where my my intersecting identities, um, I am feeling this in a unique way. And as I mentioned before, um, again, in major cities and in states that have high populations of black Americans, um, we just see this disproportionate amount of COVID deaths um, compared to the population. I would like to draw your attention, for example, to Chicago, with 30% of the population um, being, be, being Black American, but 69% of the deaths. And then in Louisiana, you see a similar trend as of August. And you know, I think of this like somebody sticking their hand into a box of Lucky Charms, where the vast majority of what's in the box is oats. But every time they stick their hand in and pull it out, it's nothing but marshmallows. Because really, for the most part, when you're 12% of the population, um, why is it that every time um, COVID goes to stick its hand in the box of Lucky Charms, all it pulls out is this tiny percentage of what's inside? Well, that's a good question. And you know, one of the things as we get proximate is to think about humanizing this risk um, that we keep talking about more than just numbers. Who are these people? <clears throat> they are people like this friend here that works with me at Grady who works in environmental services. 
um, who has small children at home, who works hourly, and you know, who has been greatly impacted by COVID. It's like one of our clerks on the unit who um, every day is the person that's um, speaking to different people and who now has a lot of um, hours cut again because of COVID. And then it's our hospital transporters, again, individuals who have high risk jobs with low pay. And so a lot of these individuals, as you can see, what they have in common is that they share my race. And um, as we move forward, I want to draw this complicated thing to your, your attention. And here's what I want to show you at the very top here. It is just helping. This is a, a way to calculate a risk um, for COVID by occupation. And they look at your physical proximity each day to other people, how likely you are to be exposed, and then your contact with others daily. And if we zoom in here, we look at the larger these circles are, the more people um, that are being impacted by this. So we have retail salespersons, ma maids, wait staff, those are our bigger circles, personal care aides, registered nurses, nursing assistants. And if you start to think about who those individuals are and what they look like, um, it is no shock why the COVID-19 numbers look as they do. And so as we think about Black Americans in the United States and these higher COVID related um, deaths and morbidity, um, let's just think about a few things. One, we already know that there's increased COVID exposure in certain occupations. We certainly know that um, poverty is a risk factor. Um, many people live in homes generationally um, together. So when somebody is, has a positive test, they don't really have the option to just go and isolate in their four or five bedroom home like some of us do. Um, frontline occupations, you may not be one of the people that everybody's banging the pots and pans for or cheering for the windows from, but certainly there are people that I can think of that are more, um, that are much more frontline than even me. And then of course, public transportation. But as we move forward, there's also the burden of unrecognized comorbidity in many Black Americans. Um, for many reasons, we know that um, many lack access to health care. And sometimes folks feel like, you know what, I don't necessarily know that it would make any difference if I went to see you in the hospital. And then there are those who know of what their medical problems are, um, but for system reasons and for a long history of medical mistrust, um, there's so many things and barriers that stand in the way to, um, to, to, to really achieving health equity. And really this all comes down to structural racism, which admittedly is beyond the scope of what I can talk to you about right now, but um, is certainly um, a reason that now we cannot turn our heads away from, we cannot ignore, it is so. So as all of this was happening, like all of you, me trying to figure out what to do with my kids, me trying to figure out um, where I'm gonna find some scrubs <laughs> um, and how to you know, don and doff my personal protective equipment and hoping I have enough personal protective equipment, um, more things started to happen. So as all of this was happening, then came this uptick in the chronic pandemic of racism in the United States. And so as we look back at this term pandemic occurring over a wide geographic area and affecting an exceptionally high proportion of the population, we knew that this was happening with acutely with COVID, but with racism, this chronic pandemic has been here and it's not, it's, it's, it's not anything that's new. So this image here is actually a map of um, the, the darker the, the color of the state, the more hate groups there are per capita. And so as you can see, there's nobody that doesn't have really any. Um, and um, for the most part, um, this is really just tracking the activity of hate happening in the United States and this was d d drawn up before um, the death of George Floyd. So this is something that's been going on for some time as just one example of this chronic pandemic of racism. So one is acute and unprecedented and the other is really chronic and precedented is what I'll call it because I'm not sure that's really a word. 
So what is it like right now to be Black in the time of two pandemics? Because if I'm asking you to get proximate, one of the things I, I'm hoping to do here is to really lift the hood up and say, look, I'm going to tell you what this feels like right now. So that when you send a text to someone, when you reach out, when you wonder what's going on, when you read the books, to pair it with, with humanism and understanding really what it's like for an individual. So this is from my perspective. The goal is to help you get proximate and to humanize the experience. So I'll talk to you about what's different. Um, what's not different for us? What do we feel right now? Um, what can be done? And what should be done? I'll share through the perspective of being <laughs> the daughter of this man, um, Mr. William Draper, who's my dad. Um, and that'll paint a picture of the chronicity of this pandemic and the chronicity of what it's like to, to walk through the, the chronic pandemic of racism as a Black American. So our story, at least on my father's side, begins in Birmingham, Alabama, in Jefferson County, where my father was born, um, to, it, it was one of 11 children born to my grandfather, um, Mr. William Henry Draper, and my grandmother, um, Bertha Jeter, now Bertha Jeter Draper, and um, their upbringing um, there was pretty typical of the time. My grandfather worked in a war mine. My grandmother worked in, um, stayed home with the children. Nobody was college educated and their descendants um, of chattel slavery. My family on my father's side traces right back to um, chattel slavery pretty quickly um, in Alabama. In fact, um, for many, many years, um, there was, there was a, a point where freed uh, Blacks were not even legally allowed to be in Alabama. So um, before the um, Emancipation Proclamation, there was nobody Black who lived in Alabama who was not a slave, unless they were hiding. So here's my dad back in the 40s. And um, the kinds of things that my grandfather worried about with him and his brothers um, were, were a little bit different than they are now, but the narrative was really the same. He was worried about their safety. As you can see, they were still smiling and happy, like many of us are, um, even in the face of all that's happening. But here's um, an image that was taken from the EJI uh, Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, and it's the monument, um, the lynching monument, um, that the EJI developed. And this is a picture I took of just a few of the people who were lynched um, in Macon County, um, in, excuse me, in Je Jefferson County, Alabama, which is where my father grew up. And this one right down here, what happened in around ninth, around the time my dad was a little boy, right? So my grandfather's acute concern about his boys was how he taught, how they talked to white people because he, he did not want anybody in his house to get lynched. He wanted his kids in before dark because he didn't want anybody to hang his boys from a tree. And he said that regularly to the day he died. And so as my father was growing up, this is what was happening all around him in Birmingham, Alabama. So this was in the early 60s in Birmingham, Alabama. And my father graduated from high school in 1961 from Tuskegee University, where he would be the first in the family to go to college. And in the midst of all of this chaos, he was achieving. He was a leader in school. He was studying to become an engineer. It was a really exciting time in the backdrop of a lot of racial chaos. My father was a student who was right there in the crowd in Selma, Alabama, excuse me, in Montgomery, Alabama, <clears throat> after the march from Selma to Montgomery. Again, these moments, these, these, these pivotal times were things that many Black Americans still have to sort of achieve through, and it's really not any different than now. So um, like many Black Americans, um, my father and mother would leave Alabama and follow the Great Migration to get out of the Jim Crow South um, to California, where I, was, where, I, where I was raised. And my dad got a job at Hughes Aircraft. Here's my family here. And um, really, you know, still in the midst of all of this, all of the same things were happening. All four kids would go to Tuskegee University. We followed our parents' footsteps and our grandparents' footsteps. 
and this would be the next step for us. So in 1988, I graduated from high school and in 1989, my younger sister graduated high school and it was an exciting time in my family because all four of my parents' kids were at their alma mater at the same time. My younger sister, a finance major, me, a pre-med major, my older sister, a mechanical engineering major, major and my brother in veterinary medicine school. Really exciting times. So in 1989, Amidst all this excitement and achievement, very similar to my father, the narrative was the same. There were still things happening in the news that we felt and we saw and we talked about in our dorm rooms and hushed conversations at our historically black college. And really the rest of the world wasn't talking about it. Nobody was outside holding up a sign. This is the Central Park Five. And I remember acutely when I was in college, when these young men were sent to prison um, and, uh, and, and also remember when they were acquitted, Corey Wise, Antron McRae, Kevin Richardson, Raymond Santana, and Yusuf Salam. And so again, as milestones go, I would graduate from college and oh yay, I got into medical school and I was heading to Meharry Medical College in 1992. What an exciting time. But also, again, it followed right along with the way the world has been for Black Americans for years. And this time, it was in the form of Mr. Rodney King. Um, as a graduating senior and right before starting medical school, I saw this grainy video with the rest of the world of police officers brutally beating Mr. Rodney King in my hometown of Los Angeles. And these images, they would come out and we would talk about it. And, I, and, and most of it was conversations that I had with other Black people, some with people who weren't Black, but for the most part, the people that were feeling it acutely and worrying about what it meant, um, they looked like me. I would come home to my neighborhood and um, out of anger and frustration and fear and tiredness from all of these years of this chronic pandemic of racism, this is what my neighborhood looked like. This is just a few blocks away from where I grew up. And, and admittedly, um, it is a complicated thing to see what happens in response to these things happening. But after watching that video to know that no one was, you know, was charged was a really hard pill for many to swallow. And again, we keep marching on, right? We keep marching on with new experiences and in 1996, four years later, I would graduate from medical school, from a Harry Medical College. Got, this is match day. I got my first choice um, I have med peds at Case Western Reserve in um, Cleveland, Ohio. It was a thrilling time. But also, again, it coincided with another death of another black body. This is Tyron Lewis, an 18-year-old um, kid who was shot multiple times in St. Petersburg, Florida. It led to a big uprising afterwards, very similar to what was seen in Los Angeles. And um, again, it felt like nothing new. 1999, I was finishing up residency, had been just asked to be chief resident. Again, exciting again, but another black body harmed and killed. This is Mr. Amadou Diallo. And Mr. Amadou Diallo was um, an unarmed black man who was shot 41 times in New York City. And again, um, everyone was acquitted. And so um, I'm sharing this with you to say, the, to show the chronicity of this, not just in my life, but in generations before me. This is not a new thing, but yet all the things that all of us need to do every day, sign our charts, look in our inbox, answer emails, all the things that we need to do. These are things that many of your colleagues that are Black Americans are doing, but also in the backdrop of these stories. So in 2020, um, we found ourselves um, in this space with COVID. And also, again, another milestone for me, this is the year that I became a full professor. Um, it was a dream for me and a, an, an exciting time. But the truth is, I was already bracing myself for what would come with it because with every milestone um, and every year, there seems to be another um, moment with a black body. But never had this ever happened at the same time as a, as a world wide pandemic. This part was now new. And again, um, what does that really mean? What does that mean to someone like me, right? To have this chronic pandemic of racism happening, to be a physician caring for patients with COVID in the hospital, 
many of whom look like me, many of whom um, are looking to me to, to, um, to, to build trust with and rapport and to feel safe um, and to close gaps when family can't come and see them. And again, it, seeing the lucky charms, it doesn't, doesn't really feel so lucky at all. So what does it really mean? I'm gonna show you what it really means in my day. Probably something that you haven't seen. It means this. It means that when the, the majority of the patients in the hospitals are black and you're black and many physicians are not black, you are the doctor in the family for a lot of people. So here's just a tiny handful of some of the text messages that were in my, in my phone that I screenshotted just to show you in real time the impact of what it was like to be a black physician with um, near peers, family members and colleagues affected by COVID. Um, here's one friend who told me that they were having a little trouble breathing, um, trying to figure out um, if they might um, need oxygen. This person had been hospitalized. Um, this is my friend's mom who was um, admitted to the hospital. And um, I would sort of, I had a whole list of about 10 or 15 people that I would text every morning and make these virtual rounds on. Um, at this point, um, this is a perfectly healthy woman in her 60s, but now she has a feeding tube. Um, another person, um, this is uh, April 4th. Um, sorry to bug you, but my husband's been very sick. We tested positive for the virus. Do I need to get on the list to get tested? Um, how are you doing? Did your pulse ox arrive? Here's another one. Um, me talking to a friend who I told to get a pulse ox. Um, just took temperature 103.4. Here's another one. <laughs> I'm trying to help somebody remain isolated and understand what that means. They're trying to figure out because this person has small kids, was a single parent, is trying to figure out how do I take care of my kids and be away from them for 14 days when I live in an apartment. Um, and here's another friend. This was the text that I sent to her um, that she didn't respond to because after a I was texting back and forth for two days in the hospital. Um, she went to the ICU. This is the same friend. And this friend is um, a woman who is in her early 40s, a single parent of a son um, who doesn't have any other family in Atlanta. And um, at this point, I, we, we are all preparing for her to die. Um, trying to talk to her mother who's in another state who can't come see her, trying to figure out experimental things. And again, um, when you think about the dis disparate numbers of Black physicians in the United States, this is sort of what was taxing many of us during this time. And then um, here is the same friend. Um, you know, these are um, people trying to um, create um, plasma drives, anything they can do, um, to try to help somebody um, to, to do a little bit better. And this note here, she was traked this morning, um, waiting to hear from her mom. Again, this is a woman with um, barely any medical problems, but again, a, a young black American um, person. And these are the types of text messages. And I could multiply this easily by 50. I would get these all day while caring for patients on the wards with COVID and I can't turn away. So as all of that was happening, right, all of that, then came this. And I'm gonna show you this particular picture first because this image of Amy Cooper, who um, was a woman who uh, called the police on this man, Mr. Christian Cooper, who was bird watching and asked her to put her dog on a leash. It was actually one of the most terrifying things I feel like I'd ever seen. Why? Because on paper, this is somebody who was supposed to be an ally. This is somebody that probably would be marching beside you in the Black Lives Matter rally, right? This is a liberal woman. Um, and to watch someone wield Blackness against you as a weapon, I mean, to be caught on film was a terrifying thing to see. Then came this. Uh oh. I'm sorry. Just one second. And this is Zoom. Okay. So then came um, Mr. Ahmad Arbery's death. Um, Mr. Ahmad Arbery 
um, was a, a gentleman who was in Brunswick, Georgia, who was running through his neighborhood and was unfortunately chased down by neighbors who thought that he looked suspicious. And unfortunately, um, he would be shot and ultimately killed. As you all know, this is Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor is um, a young woman who had her home forcibly entered by police on a warrant. She was woken from her bed, shot and killed. And this wasn't new. This really wasn't new. Um, the thing is we'd seen this happen with Trayvon Martin. We'd seen someone chased down because of, because of being black. And again, this is all happening now in the face of COVID. So that part was new. And then came this, the death of Mr. George Floyd, caught on film as everyone watched. And I think that this one was one that woke up the rest of the world too. I think many people saw this and thought, wow, this is a whole different thing that we're dealing with now. So Mr. George Floyd, um, as, you, as many of you know, was a gentleman who was um, accosted by the police and this gentleman kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And admittedly, I know that there are many people who don't like the sight of this image. They find it troubling and upsetting. But imagine if you've been looking at something like this for your entire life. That's what it's like, um, especially in the face of this pandemic that is already troubling for the rest of us. And the truth is, as mentioned before, this is all precedented. This is not something that's new that we haven't experienced before. Um, but um, we rally we try to figure out how to work through it, right? From the time of my grandfather worrying about his sons being lynched to those who were slaves, trying to figure out how to survive, going across the Atlantic stacked in boats, um, and, and just trying to survive as one of 11 children in Jefferson County, Alabama. But not in the time of COVID too. That part we had not yet experienced. So again, then came this, the response of the rest of the world. Because see, in the past, this was always something that we did in private. We mourned these deaths alone. We talked to each other. We, we, we texted one another. Our social media feeds of Black Americans were filled with, did you see what happened? Did you hear about what happened? So this part, everybody else turning their gaze onto us and caring um, was really new. And, and to be clear, there were many, many people who've cared for years, but this collective caring, the tsunami of caring was new and somewhat for many of us overwhelming. So what did that look like? That looked like this. So along with all of the COVID messages, along with trying to figure out what to do with the kids and what to do next, started getting these texts. How are you? Been thinking of you. I don't know if there's a right thing to say these days, but I'm thinking of you. That's a, that's a perfect thing to say, I said. Um, I need to tell you that I'm thinking of you um, and your family, your sons. There's nothing reassuring to say. And as my own children have said, we should not, we should not be reassured. Please know that I'm thinking of you and please forgive me if I say or do the wrong thing. My heart is in the right place. Enjoy your vacation. And, and I'm showing you these things because this is the stuff that was coming over people's text messages who look like me, along with all of the emails that you're getting about COVID, along with all of the messages that we're getting about who has, um, whose mama has COVID, who's gonna get trached, what's gonna happen next and what to do day to day. And so this piece is really different for us. Um, this has been a really unique and difficult Part. So in this time, what's different? What's not different? What do we feel? What can be done? What should be done? So what's different and how this feels? I already shared a little bit about how this feels. What's different is that we're in the time of COVID. 
But also what's different is that things are being caught on film and also people are recognizing that the individuals that you originally thought of as on your side are not always the ones who are on your side. And that is a terrifying thing. It left a lot of black Americans or at least me feeling like, I don't know who's being honest and who isn't. So this hopelessness came particularly in response to what happened with Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper that I think deserves for people to slow down and look at. Many people ignored that happening because of what happened with Mr. George Floyd, but I do think it's a, a particularly upsetting piece that many of us thought about. What's not different? What's not different is worrying about um, our families, worrying about the safety of the people that we love. That part is not new. And so um, these images, again, that I'm showing you are just underscoring this piece that says, hey, this really is not a new thing. So what do we wish people knew? Well, we wish many people knew that this isn't new, that this unprecedented time, it has a unique impact on Black people. That indifference is really hurtful. Um, even if you're thinking something and hoping that somebody is, um, is okay, um, sometimes if you don't say anything at all, it can appear that you don't care, which truthfully has been the experience for many people's full life. Awkward is okay. Those text messages, they were really awkward. I even had somebody send me some money on Cash App once because they just said they didn't know what to do. Um, and awkward beats silence though. We also want you to know that we're afraid and we're grieving and we're afraid in a different way now because along with the fear that we already have about COVID, um, that image of Amy Cooper gave me a new fear that felt like you just never know what could happen. But there's other things that we wish people knew too. And that is being specific matters, okay? So it's not enough to say that um, something sort of happened to someone or that an unfortunate event happened. These are the murders of black bodies. And so referring to them as people of color, this is a good time to be specific. The individuals who have been targeted and the unarmed individuals who've been shot and killed, they aren't just people of color, they're black. And many of them are black Americans or um, black immigrants. And so be specific and have the courage to call it what it is. Unfortunate events do not say the same thing as murders of unarmed black people. Um, because a murder um, suggests that the person was, was killed and they weren't supposed to die. Now, what can you do? What else can be done? Well, we can do the work. And I say we, because again, this work is something that I, I'm working through just along with all of the rest of you. So broadening our fund of knowledge through books, remembering that people are grieving, that's our opportunity to get proximate. Explore your implicit biases. Be a brave bystander um, and avoid performative allyship. I know that many people worry a lot about um, what it means to be an ally, but do recognize that um, things that are just sort of done to kind of go with the flow, those can hurt more than not doing anything at all. In other words, you have to get proximate enough to somebody who is acutely living the experience to be able to ask them how they feel or how the things you're doing may be landing. The other thing I think we're all charged to do is to get disrupted. So um, I find a few things that I've been looking at and reading and listening to to be very disruptive and I just have a few recommendations to you. So um, first, um, When They See Us, which is the story of the Central Park Five, it's like a five part um, mini series that was on Netflix. It will move you to tears, it will sicken you, but um, it, it is one of those things that once you see it, you can't unknow it. And it's amazing and astounding how many people never ever even knew this story. Um, and, I, and this was a, a very hot topic that we were talking about when I was in college. The 13th looks at um, the, the mass incarceration and this movement in the United States of how we move from having um, many of our black men in, in chattel slavery and how we now have more black men in, cha in, in um, United States prisons than we ever had in chattel slavery at any point in time. 
Here's a few um, podcasts that I found helpful, um, seen on radio, particularly the, the series on Seeing White. It's a 12 part series on the history of race in the United States, absolutely riveting and will change the way you think. And then um, books that I've read recently that have absolutely disrupted me, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, um, a really important book that um, calls for all of us to think about being, um, being anti-racist, not just people who don't identify as Black. Um, I found many of his ideas very um, compelling. Medical apartheid, for those of us in medicine, I think it's incredibly important for us to take the time to really um, read this book and um, allow yourself to be disrupted and to understand more about why many people feel the way they feel. And it will be particularly important as we move to a space of needing to um, talk to our patients about getting um, vaccinated for COVID-19. And then uh, most recently cast by um, the brilliant I Isabel Wilkerson is really um, a uh, just um, a mind blowing book that, that really looks not just at race in the United States, but how race dictates caste in the United States with um, those who are black um, being of the subordinate caste and those who are white being of the dominant caste and really um, likening it to other places in the world that have caste systems. Very, very powerful and will really shake up and disrupt the way that you think. On a system level, it's very similar to what can be done on an individual level. You know, if you are a dean, if you are in a leadership role, if you are a manager, if you are leading a ward team, listen more than you talk. If you have somebody on your team and they are black and all of these things are happening, um, I want you to know that the story that I told you, it mirrors many, many people's stories. This long-standing chronic thing that's happening, these text messages coming in on an influx, um, this is the lived experience of many Black Americans that most talk to them each other about. But um, I think it's important if we're going to be real true allies to understand people's lived experience. Don't delay your support. Um, even if you feel nervous about it, um, it's one of some of the most, the biggest fails that we saw um, in the death of George Floyd was how many leaders people in leadership roles and how many organizations did not immediately um, respond um, by, by coming out with a statement. And even if it feels like you're in an echo chamber, know that many of the people who are greatly impacted by these things um, are counting on you to say, I see you, I see that this happened and, I, and, and I'm with you. We already mentioned about being specific. If you're in a leadership role and you're gonna write a letter, be specific. Don't skirt around the issue, call it what it is. Um, make support a verb. If you have colleagues who are working with you and you are concerned about them, let, let your support be felt and, and don't let up. I think one of the biggest fears that I have and many of my near peers have is that, um, that many people of privilege are so used to being able to tackle a problem and having things work out the way they want when they're ready to work it out. Um, that there's a fear that people will kind of look at racism and then turn away from it and move on to do whatever else they need to do. So stay the course. Meaningful DEI efforts in, in systems will be very important, much like what you have at CU. Fight micro invalidations. Start paying attention to who's around you and who's been othered and who's been ignored and don't hide. Um, organizations cannot hide in this time. As uncomfortable as it is, we'd rather you be uncomfortable than silent or indifferent. So what is a pandemic? A pandemic, again, occurs over a wide geographic area. It affects an exceptionally high proportion of the population. And what we now know is that there are two pandemics happening right now which meet this definition. One is unprecedented, right? Um, at least the times that we're in in our lifetime, it's unprecedented. The other one is precedented. And I want you to know that for Black Americans, there's still a lot of joy. Um, even in this time with all of the difficulty and all of the slow singing and flower bringing, there's still a lot of hugs and smiles and celebration um, and enjoying what it means to be Black. 
And if nothing else, if the things I told you as I walk through my house to avoid noise from kids and sounds, I want you to humanize this and know that this person that's talking to you is a mother. She's a mom who acutely worries about her sons who are not ambiguous in their race, um, who no longer look innocent and who could be perceived as a threat regardless of their pedigree. Um, this is what is happening. And so I will leave you with this reading, um, which I would like for you just to reflect on as we wrap. This is called Perspective in the Time of COVID. I'm squatting in a corner with my hands over my ears. Noise. It is too much noise about us, about me, because us is me. It is inescapable. So much noise. Make it stop. Your people are dying. They're dying from a virus. No, not that virus. Oh, wait, that virus too. I mean, yeah. They're dying from heart disease, cancer, violence, and this, more, most, just fill in the blank. We win, but really, we lose. We lose. The baggage was left on front lawns and piles, centuries worth. Maybe push it to the backyard? Not yours, though. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Wrong. Get A's, become a doctor, right? Wrong. The same baggage spills out front, blocks the entrance and the exit. We lose. The words, they are so awful, so hurtful. Those words weren't directed at me, but they were really, because us is me. So they hit my jaw like a fist, hard. And that was just this week. Yeah. Running, chased, pursued, shot, which reminds me. The other day, our neighbors told us that before we moved in, they came into our home, looked around, checked it out, furniture, photos, and all. No human was shot, no character assassinated, not that time at least. A woman frantically calls 911. An African-American man is threatening my life. A bird watching one, no less. When my dad had a heart attack, I said, say you have chest pressure and that you're sweating even though he wasn't, to create urgency and to not get him overlooked. I guess people say what they know will work. A beloved elder in my family got hospitalized. My dad calls me worried, dad. He's trying to leave the hospital, Kimberly, me. Why? Dad, he's scared he might die there. He doesn't trust them and he doesn't want to be alone. What do you say to that? I try to call straight to voicemail, sigh more noise, heated exchanges. It's all too much, especially now. All of it is so loud. I try to press my hands tighter to my ears to drown it out. I can't. I slowly peel my fingers away and stand up. The noise is still there. It's always there. I drag in a breath of air and lean my head against the wall, swallowing hard. Then I wait for my ears to acclimate like always, and they do but I don't unhear, I do not, this. This is what it was like to be black this week, at least for me. A cacophony of noises clattering all around me in a pitch that I hear in Dolby stereo all day long. Plus an expectation for me to hold my head up, do my job, represent and not startle, yeah. But I thank God for the other sounds, the clapping hands and the snapping fingers, the throaty laughs and that special interdental fricative in our vernacular that I recognize even on the phone. We are connected. We have handled louder, worse noises and kept on singing. Do I want to be someone else? Not for one day, but still. Sometimes I do wish that I could, if only for a minute, turn down the noise or turn it up so loud that everyone hears it the same, or at least will startle sometimes. Yeah, that. My sons are upstairs laughing and yelling at their video game. My husband has the TV up way too loud watching the news. He calls out to me, him, babe, did you see this in Minneapolis? Me, silence. He shows me, 
more, most, I can't unsee or unhear. We lose again. My loved one was discharged against the medical advice, but is home now and okay. Dad is less worried, good. And with all of this noise, life is still happening. What will our kids do this summer? Son, why'd you get a B? Honey, text me as soon as you get there. And sorry for the delay in replying to your emails. This is what goes on. Between revising rejected manuscripts, thinking about my patients and clearing my inbox, between figuring out summer plans, washing dishes, folding laundry, and wondering what will happen with school for me, for us. So right now, I'm just sitting at my kitchen table, listening to some earth, wind, and fire, being black, writing down my feelings, and doing my best to just keep on singing. I'll close with um, allowing Shanta Zimmer to answer this question, which is something I started saying to my children when they were very small boys. But now I say to them still to this day, but it's taken new meaning. Son, <laughs> what would my life be if something happened to you? It would be ruined. 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 I want you to feel the same way about my son too. Thank you for getting proximate. That's all I got. Made it all the way to the end and I cried at the end. Dang, y'all. <laughs> Put you. me on the spot too. Um, while people are thinking about questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Manning, um, first I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to get proximate because I know that that's a two way um, street. I put into the chat box um, something that I forgot to mention earlier, which is that she's also the executive producer of a special edition series of podcasts from the Nocturnist called um, Black Voices in Healthcare. Um, I highly recommend it if you want to practice getting um, proximate. I also want you to, um, and I'll send this out later, take a listen um, to an interview in another podcast um, on Juneteenth where you can learn more um, about the amazing life of Mr. Draper through the eyes of his daughter. Um, and, and then I, I just- to apologize for every possible ambient house noise that could happen. I'm so sorry for all the noise. You know what? I think it's part of the pandemic that you mentioned. Um, it was totally appropriate. <laughs> um, this, uh, for you uh, Academy members who are here, we will, we did record this. Thank you, Dr. Manning, for allowing us to record um, your amazing talk. Um, and it will be linked to our website um, in the near future. I wanna also say thanks to Aaron McKay for helping organize today and um, making sure that we could have an audience of over 225 people um, join us. Um, it was very, very special. Um, and I think all of these, the advice that you give us, I think from an educator's perspective is a really helpful message um, to improve what some of um, my colleagues have heard me talk about, which is our moral courage, our ability to feel strong and speak up. Um, so that's the other amazing gift that you gave us today is just a reminder about how we could um, speak up um, for our trainees, for our students, for our colleagues, for our black colleagues in particular, um, in this chronic um, pandemic. Um, we see you. Um, a reminder from Aaron is there in the chat to also please uh, fill out the evaluation form for this session. Um, thank you so very much. Um, we will make CME available for it as well. Um, Dr. Manning, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. I think people are crying and so they can't ask questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm crying because somebody decided to use a leaf blower next to me as I gave grand rounds in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we hope to get you back here for real in life uh, soon. Um, I, I told everybody, I just wanted to say one more thing because it may have disappeared with all the amazing comments um, to look back at the Black Voices in Healthcare. And again, I'll email that out. And it's 10 episodes. They're really um, all worth it, 35 minutes roughly um, each and one special um, encore episode. If you want to pick one to start with, I advise you to start with joy. 
um, because that is also a really powerful message for us to remember um, while we're talking about people, uh, black men, black women being shot and killed. There is also so much joy that we should be celebrating. And at University of Colorado, we believe that diversity brings us excellence. Um, this is not an institution that looks at this from a deficit perspective. Um, and the message um, that comes out in Black Joy is really a reminder of how diversity improves us and makes us better. Um, I'll quote Dean Riley and say that we are aspirational in our um, commitment to diversity and excellence and inclusive excellence here. One so other thing to again applaud yourselves again because at um, um, at Colorado, <clears throat> much of what everybody else was scrambling to do, you already had an infrastructure and you were doing. Um, I, I mean, I laid on the concrete with you all back in December and it was, it, you had been doing it for multiple years already. Um, and then my institution ed isn't something that we had been doing. Um, so um, shout out to the medical students um, and, and just the, all the courage that you've had to, to stand up. And I want you to know just as one person, I, I, it, it really helps to feel seen. So thank you. We do have one question, Kimberly, if you have time, Dr. Sure, Manning. I do. I do. Um, one is advice um, about how, if you are a member of a community, maybe a staff member or somebody who's not in a prominent leadership role, how do you get your leadership to speak up around these issues? How do you, um, if you're a black employee, address these kinds of things to the leadership? What advice would you have? Yeah, that, that is a, that's a very difficult thing for many people um, to handle, right? Because one of the things that what you're really asking someone to do is to be a bystander on their own behalf. Because silence in a time like this, in such a pivotal time, is really, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a micro invalidation, right? Um, to, to not, it's like somebody tripping and falling and knocking their teeth out and you stepping over them and keeping walking, right? So um, a few things that you can do is depending upon what the hierarchy is, right? If you're very low on the hierarchy and you are concerned, um, then you, you need to, to go to somebody um, who is possibly at the, at the leadership level and um, talk to somebody that you feel is an ally or talk to somebody who might be a couple steps ahead of you um, that, that might help. Like, for example, if one of my residents had a concern that wanted to reach my chair, they could talk to me and I'm in closer proximity to our chair. But also, um, one of the goals that I always have is to come in to anything with a solution. Um, and so um, instead of saying, why y'all don't do this? Why y'all don't do that? Um, come in and say, you know, this is an opportunity and to bring out the best in the people that are on this team, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to do more. Um, I would suggest we have, we create a task force that, that gets information about the climate of how people are feeling right now. I would suggest, um, so really um, I push the students often who come and complain to me about even a module, a lecture. I'm like, well, what do you suggest? What's wrong with it? What, what, do, you, what do you, what should they do? Um, so main things is um, get an ally, um, but think of a solution and be ready to work on the solution because many things fall on deaf ears if it's just a complaint. Um, and it is exhausting when you're already tired and you're hurting. You're like, why I got to come up with the solution? Um, I get it. I get it. I am, I am feeling it right now. But that picture I showed you of the, at the beginning with those students, the, and my sons, that makes me go hard because I do not want them to be having these conversations um, when they are full professors. <laughs> <laughs> and they will be, I know it. Um, thank you again, Dr. Manning. Um, we're gonna send out your materials. Um, thank you for being a teacher to me um, continuously for my entire life of knowing you. Um, I think you've had a very prolific summer um, and done a lot of teaching. And I think you probably, um, it's good that you are already a full professor, but if you needed to add anything to your teaching portfolio, boy, this summer, you could have just like hit it out of the park. So <laughs> and thanks again. shout out to everybody helping with my imposter syndrome in the comments by uh, making me feel better about running around my house to avoid the leaf blower, man. So I... Y'all, I really appreciate that. I really need this right now because I'm like panicking over this. But thank you so much. No, no matter how cool anybody looks at the end of the day, we're still just, just folks trying to figure it out who don't want dogs to bark or leaves to blow. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Kimberly. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.